a very, very happy Easter to all of you. This is considered as one of the most auspicious days for the Christian community. The day marks the resection of Jesus Christ. According to the New Testament of the Bible, Easter is believed to have occurred three days after Jesus Christ was crucified by the Romans and died in roughly 30 AD. Jesus was crucified on the day of Good Friday and buried in a grave after his last supper with his disciples, which is commemorated as Maundy Thursday. As his followers and disciples mourn his demise, on the third day, when his disciples visited his grave, they found it to be empty. It is this day that marks the triumph of Christ over death, and this also makes him the Son of God. However, contrary to popular belief, Easter was not always the day that signified Christ's resurrection. Earlier, it was a pagan celebration that marked the rebirth and the renewal as it comes during the spring season. As a pagan celebration of early spring, the day honored Easter, the pagan Saxon goddess. The change of tradition came when the early missionaries converted the Saxons to Christianity. With that, the meaning of Easter also underwent a change in order to signify the new tradition. The day of celebration changed and came to be known as Easter. In this sense, Easter is very similar to Noros and Holi, which too mark the, uh, 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 the coming of spring season. Humanity and its experiences and their manifestations are similar throughout the world. On this happy occasion, we have assembled again to discuss a topic which has again been almost a universal experience. The undermining of the places of worship of a vanquished community or group. It is an experience shared throughout the pre-modern world. We have examples of old pagan monuments being replaced by other pagan monuments. Jewish religious places turned into Christian, Buddhist, and Jain into Shaivite or Vaishnavite, Vaishnavite into Shaivite or vice versa. From Dome of Rocks to Hagia Sophia, the world is full of such examples. Some of the stones with Hindu iconography fixed in the Qutub complex reportedly have defaced Buddhist and Jain icons on their back. At Bir Chabili Tila at Fatehpur Sikri, D. Sharma of Archaeological Survey of India dug out a Jain temple which had been converted to a Vaishnava temple. The broken Jain images from the original temple were found buried in a pit near the refurbished temple. These idols are now on display and for some time the press reports suggested as if it was the doing of Akbar. Alka Patel, in one of her articles, notes a Ghorid mosque converted into a temple. She is talking of the uh, Jageshwar Mandir of Sadadi in Rajasthan. This research is being published in Breaking Idols, Making Icons, the History and Historiography of Reuse in South Asia. However, in modern day India, we are more concerned with the desecration and destruction of temples by the Muslim kings. The cacophony which is created does not remain confined to Mir Baqi, that is Babri uh, Masjid of Ayodhya, or the mosque at Varanasi. It spills over to such claims as the Taj is uh, Tejo Mahalaya temple, or even the Red Fort being a site of yet another temple. Some claim more than 30,000 temples were desecrated by Aurangzeb alone. In fact, there are two predominant theories of temple destruction, uh, the desecrations by medieval Muslim states in India. Andrevink 
a noted scholar of medieval Indian history suggests that temple desecrations were motivated by Islamic iconoclasm. He cites the early Arabic literature on India, which was notable for its derision towards the practice of polytheism and idol worship by its inhabitants. Furthermore, he suggests that the early Islamic invaders were familiar with sacred Hindu geography and systematically targeted the key religious sites of Mathra, Banaras, Somnath, and Ujjain. Richard Eaton, on the other hand, contends that temple desecrations were driven by their importance in the royal iconography. Hindu kings of the early uh, medieval period built grand temple complexes which came to be associated with their political authority. The temple desecrations were therefore undertaken not to be debase the sanctity of the idols, but to undermine the political legitimacy of their patrons. In his view, this also meant that the desecrations were mainly committed during military battles. Once the Muslim state established its reign over a territory, existing temples were left alone. Today, we have Professor Richard uh, Eaton uh, with us to elucidate, uh, elucidate on this important theme. He needs no introduction. All of us know him. He has also been on our program before as well. I will only say this much of him, that he is the author of some very prominent and good books, including Sufis of Bijapur and the India in the Persianate Age, 1000 to 1765. Over to you, Professor Eaton. Let us welcome him. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Rezavi, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and your historical uh, explanation of, of the, the story of Easter, which indeed is what we are celebrating uh, this morning. This is morning here, Easter Sunday morning in, in Arizona. Um, although I know it's evening in, in India. So um, I, I'm very glad that you mentioned the um, different opinions that have been proposed about the issue of temple desecration uh, Professor Andre Vink is a good friend of mine, but we have uh, sharply disagreed on a number of uh, points of Indian history, one of which is this question of, of temple desecration in Indian history. And what I'd like to do today is, is to try to put this whole question of temple desecration into a larger context. and raise the question of what are the various different ways in which political figures uh, identified themselves or related to uh, monuments and, and, st and structures, especially those structures associated with a defeated enemy. My point here being that uh, temple desecration or destruction was not the only thing that happened. There was a range of, of responses which I think historians need to uh, take into account, uh, and desecration being only one of them. The first point that I think needs to be established that you yourself, uh, Professor Rezavi, made is that is the contrast between royal temples and ordinary village temples or temples that patronized by, by local civilians. Um, Royal temples were understood as housing the icon, the image, or the, the murti, of the deity that was understood as, as sovereign over the territory uh, that a king ruled. So in that sense, a king is only a servant of the deity whose image is included uh, in that, uh, or inserted in that royal temple. This means that royal temples were politically charged. These were the sites where new dynasties were established, where they were reconfirmed, and where they were contested. 
And uh, this is an old pattern in Indian history. Uh, we can go back at least to the 600s, where we have evidence of uh, temples being targeted by enemy uh, Maharajas, uh, kings of such dynasties as the, Pala, uh, the Pallavas, the Chalukyas, the Rashtrakutas, the Pandyas, the Chandelas, the Cholas, the Kalingas, the Prataharas, the Chohanas, and so forth. They all engaged in attacking the temples of their enemies. Um, and we see this. Could I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so desecration is one of seven possible uh, responses that political actors might have to such uh, monuments as temples. Next slide, please. So here we have a, for example, a statement made by the Maharaja of the Kalyana Chalukyas in the 12th century. Uh, Maharaja Shomashvara the third. Uh, the enemy's capital city should be burned. The palace of the king, beautiful buildings, palaces of princes, ministers, and high-ranking officers, temples, streets with shops, horse and elephant stables. So this is a recommendation made by the emperor himself, the Maharaja himself. And my point being that this was normal political activity that had been going on for some six centuries before the advent of Turks uh, in North India. Um, and so when we confront the question of what Muslims were doing with respect to these temples, which I understand is a very uh, contested issue, we first must understand also that this is a very difficult thing to establish with certainty precisely because the data that we have is so incomplete. Uh, it's something like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle in which about half the pieces are missing. <laughs> and you're trying to make a complete picture when you only have a, a few fragments. Um, furthermore, some temples could have been desecrated, but there is no record of that desecration. Or temples might have been desecrated and they were recorded, but the record no longer survives. Uh, on the other hand, some chronicles might have claimed that their patron sultan or, or, or king or whoever it was uh, engaged in temple desecration, when in fact there is no evidence that that ever occurred, uh, that many chroniclers were trying to please their emperor and make them sound more pious than they actually were. And finally, there were some temples that were desecrated, and, and there are records of those desecrations, contemporary records. And that is what we have to go on. Historians can only make judgments based on evidence that we do have. So when I first engaged with this issue, I made a thorough study of the epigraphs, that is to say the inscriptions, together with chronicles, Persian chronicles, uh, that were recorded at about the same time as these events had occurred. And I decided that in order to understand this question, what we need to do is to situate each known case of temple desecration in its specific context. In other words, we need to know who did it, where was it done, why was it done, in what context was it done. And of course, when did it happen? And when you do this, um, you you come up with some rather interesting patterns. And that was my objective. You know, what what are the patterns that one finds? So I took all the known cases and I came up with a figure of eighty, roughly from eleven ninety two to seventeen sixty five, and I put them on maps to understand in spatial terms. Uh, where they were found, and also chronologically, numbers 1 through 80, to find out what kinds of pattern exists. Uh, the uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, between 1192 and 1204, the first 
uh, decade, really, of the Ghurid invasions, when the Delhi Sultanate was established, sees a moving military frontier. Uh, next, please. Right. What you see in this arrow are the first nine temples, chronologically, that were destroyed, starting in the northwest, and uh, in Ajmer, actually, uh, number one, and moving right on down through the uh, to Bihar toward Bengal. And uh, what we see here is a pattern uh, of a moving military frontier where royal temples lay in the path of, of these Gurid armies. Next slide, please. It was a, obviously a very violent uh, decade uh, as suggested by these coins that were minted uh, by the by the Gourds. Uh, the earliest coin we have minted in Bengal, 1204. These you see on the left, a gold coin depicting a horseman uh, with a mace in his hand uh, and with a David Agri inscription uh, uh, the, the, in, indicating the, the conquest of, of, of Bengal. Uh, Gore Vijaya, the, the conquest of, of Bengal. Same thing in the lower right, uh, where you have the, the Islamic credo uh, encircling uh, a horseman, again, with a mace in his hand. Uh, so there's no question about the violence that occurred uh, as this frontier was moving down the, the Gangetic Plain. Next slide, please. And then the next series of, of temples that we find are those that were found in Rajasthan and Gujarat as armies moved in this area, uh, kind of a second wave. And from there, next slide, uh, further south into the Deccan and ultimately into the, the, uh, the Tamil country. Um, and uh, these, these conquests uh, were characterized in, in every case by the desecration of temples that were identified with or associated with or patronized by uh, uh, kings who were enemies of the, of the advancing uh, Turks. Uh, next slide, please. For example, uh, here we have uh, in the early 14th century, the Delhi uh, Sultanate is now under the control of the Tughluqs, uh, more particularly, uh, Sultan Giyasuddin Tughluq, the founder of the dynasty, has sent his son uh, down to the south to punish the Maharaja of the Kakatiya dynasty in Warangal, which is in Andhra, punish him because he had not been paying his annual tribute. And uh, this was Prataparudra, the last uh, Maharaja of the Kakatiya dynasty. And when the armies reached this area, they totally demolished the great uh, Swayambhu Shiva temple, which had been the principal temple of the, the Kakatiya dynasty. Um, next, please. And then uh, another, uh, when we move into the 14th century, uh, the late 14th and 15th century, and, and early in the 16th century, now we have, uh, after uh, uh, Timur has sacked Delhi, and the uh, crippling the uh, Tughluq dynasty, the successor states to the Tughluqs are appearing, the Sultanates in Kashmir, in Malwa, in Gujarat, uh, in the Deccan, and they too are establishing their authority uh, amidst the chaos of the dissolution of the, uh, of the Tughluq dynasty of Delhi. And in, 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 in cases where uh, uh, Chieftains had earlier professed loyalty to the state, but then uh, rebelled against the state. Not only were they executed, but their temples were destroyed. Again, the association being made that uh, temples were state property once they were brought under the control of the Sultanate. But if the, if the patrons of those temples rebelled, then both they and the temple uh, were were liable for punishment. Uh, that was the, that was the principle. Um, and I might add that Hindu generals also participated in the in, in temple destruction. 
uh, serving uh, uh, states. For example, uh, uh, we see this in <clears throat> in uh, the case of Andhra, where Murahari Rao was a general under the uh, uh, the uh, Bahmani kings, and uh, he destroyed a temple in uh, I hope not destroy the temple. He took the the icon of the temple of uh, Ahobilam in southern Andhra and brought it back to Golconda as a trophy. Uh, next slide, please. And then in the Mughal period, uh, again, th this is a fascinating moment here because when the Mughals come to power, obviously uh, there are no longer uh, what you have is a, is a disintegration of the Delhi Sultanate. And the Delhi Sultans, since they were Muslim, uh, there was no question of patronizing of, 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 uh, of, of temples that needed to be destroyed. So we do not find in the cases of Babur or Humayun or Akbar uh, significant instances of temple desecration at all. Uh, this only happens when, again, chieftains who had been loyal to the Mughals begin to uh, uh, rebel. And so when we come to the periods of uh, Shah Jahan, uh, and especially under Anangzeb, uh, when rebellions were occurring both in Rajasthan and in the Deccan, uh, we again see instances of temple desecration, which is exactly what this slide is trying to show uh, at this time. So in sum, to summarize very briefly, what I'm trying to suggest here is that there seems to be a very clear correlation between the either the establishment or the re-establishment of, of states and the desecration of temples which were identified with enemies of those states. Now, next slide. I'd like to go on to a second mode of, of, of relating to temples, which is actually, in a sense, more much more common than destruction or desecration, and that is simply non-intervention. Because royal temples were the temples that were targeted, all other temples seem to be left alone. And we see this happening uh, uh, not only at the, at the level of village temples or, or smaller temples, but also former royal temples. That is, temples that had been under the control of a ruling dynasty, but that ruling dynasty was no longer in power. And in those situations, uh, temples were, were, were left alone. Next slide. In Kajuraho, for example, a good example is the famous temple complexes that were patronized by the Chandela Maharajas around the beginning of the 11th century. Uh, but the critical point here is that in the mid-11th century, around 1040, the Chandelas abandoned Kajuraho and reestablished their capital uh, in other sites, principally in Mahoba, uh, not far from, from uh, Kajuraho. That then became uh, a target of attacks, first by the Shahana Rajputs, uh, which sacked the city under Pithyuraj III, by the way, the same, uh, that was in 1182, 10 years before he in turn was defeated by, uh, by uh, Muhammad of Gore. Uh, uh, but my point is that by that time, uh, Kajaraho, the old temple of the Chandelas, uh, was no longer politically important. Uh, it was irrelevant. It, it was rendered, in a sense, uh, inert and, and, and had no political meaning, and therefore uh, it was uh, left alone. Uh, next slide. The same thing happens in the Deccan Plateau. Uh, here you see the famous Thousand Pillar Temple in Hanumakonda. And the Hanumakonda was the first capital of the Kakatiya dynasty in Andhra, and it remained capital from, from roughly uh, 1000 to, uh, to 1200. And then in around 1200, the capital was moved from Hanumakonda to Warangal, which is only, I don't know, 10 or 15 kilometers away. But the point is, this temple was no longer identified with the the icon of the deity who was understood as the sovereign of the, the territory, the Kakatiya territory, and therefore it had no political 
importance. Unlike the Swayam Bushiva temple. Next slide. This, is this, this was the temple that was the center of the Kakatiya state uh, when uh, the Tugluks arrived in the year 1323. So the army of the Tugluks simply marched right past the, uh, the, uh, the thousand column temple in Hanumakonda and went straight for this temple because this was the temple that was identified with the, the, uh, with Prataparudra, the last Maharaja of the dynasty. Next slide. Now, a third kind of way in which kings related to temples is through patronage, uh, whether by patronizing uh, an existing temple that's already standing <clears throat> or by patronizing the, the construction of a new temple. <clears throat> Excuse me. For example, uh, we have written evidence of what uh, Muslim rulers were doing. Uh, next slide. You see here on the top uh, <clears throat> in a recorded message that was written by Muhammad bin Tughluq, the Sultan of Delhi in the mid 14th century, where he writes to the Chinese emperor who had requested to build a temple in, uh, in India, permission to build a temple <clears throat> in a Muslim country can be accorded only to those who pay the jizya. If you agree to pay it, permission for building the temple can be given. Now, that was not, of course, a universal policy, but that was the particular policy of Mohammed bin Tughluq. Uh, <clears throat> when we ask the question of what happens to existing temples, uh, we have the evidence given by Nizamuddin Ahmed, the author of the Talagat Akbari, a very important history uh, in the pe period of Akbar. Uh, and he writes that Sikandar Lodi, uh, the last dynasty before the Mughals came, was advised by his own Muslim jurists that it was simply not lawful to lay waste to ancient idol temples. And this is simply a statement of what we seem to know anyway from other evidence, that we, we do not see evidence <clears throat> of temples that were already existing that were desecrated as long as their patrons were loyal to the state. <clears throat> And, and that's the point that I think needs to be made here. Uh, next, next slide. <clears throat> this is a fascinating inscription. It's a Sanskrit inscription recording the restoration of a Shiva temple in the city of Kalyana in 1326. And it is given in the classic form of uh, inscriptions that had already been familiar in this part of India, going all the way back to the Chalukya dynasty, including the sun and the moon motifs in the upper right and left hand corners, including the description of uh, Sultan Muhammad bin Tughluq, given here in Sanskrit uh, imperial titles, uh, Maharaja Dharaja Sri Suratana, the great king of kings, prosperous Sultan. <clears throat> and the point here is here that Kalyana was a city which had been the capital of the great Chalukya Empire, but that empire had already ceased to exist by the, by the uh, 12th century. So by the 14th century, Kalyana was no longer politically significant, and the Shiva temple there was, had no political meaning. Uh, we do not know what damage had been done to it or why. All we know is that the authorities of the Shiva temple approached the Muslim governor uh, of Kalyana, that this temple needed to be restored, and uh, permission to do so was granted by the Sultan himself, Muhammad bin Tughluq, and the, the uh, requested restoration took place. Now, I cite this example as interesting because we need to contrast what uh, Muhammad bin Tughluq did in 1326 when he's restoring a temple with what he had done only three years earlier. Next slide. When he destroyed the temple of uh, uh, the Swine Bushiva temple in Waterloo. The difference of his behavior, I think, illustrates very dramatically the political nature of temple desecration. <clears throat> 
because the Swine Bathsheba Temple was the uh, temple of a ruling authority, Pratapa who was an enemy king, who was disloyal to the Sultan, this temple was destroyed. Whereas in Kalyana, the Shiva temple there was actually restored to normal worship under the authority of the same man, of, of, uh, of Muhammad bin Tughluq. He was Prince Ulu Khan in 1323, but he's Sultan Muhammad bin Tughluq in 1326. Uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, we have instances of, of uh, temple patronage uh, by the Mughals, uh, and more particularly by sub-imperial officers, such as Man Singh in 1590, who builds this uh, spectacular uh, Govinda Deva temple in Vrindavan. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that you've, you see here uh, an extraordinary blending of architecture. Uh, clearly, this is an a, a imperial Mughal uh, style of architecture, uh, which has been now used to build this, this, this extraordinary temple. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. It's the same temple, just looking uh, further back, so you get some sense of the, the, uh, the cross vaulting techniques, the dome, uh, the kinds of arches, uh, the techniques of construction, which had already been uh, well developed in uh, Persian uh, architectural forms, uh, it's actually being pushed to a further degree in, in, in this temple uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, Gobinda temple. So I want to contrast this kind of uh, spectacular temple patronage in the heart of the Mughal Empire, or at least near the heart of the Mughal Empire in uh, Vrindavan, with what was happening on the distant frontier. Next slide, please. Now, if we go out way on the periphery of the Mughal Empire uh, to Bengal in this instance, we find a very different kinds of temples and mosques that are being built. Uh, far from being grand structures made of marble or stone, what we, what we find in Bengal are very simple, uh, crude temples and mosques that are built out of thatching and bamboo of the type you see depicted in this image. And what's interesting is that there's a huge burst of temple construction and mosque construction under in the reign, under Aurangzeb, the reign of Aurangzeb in the in the uh, in the late 17th century. Uh, under his reign, there's a huge push to settle the frontier, and the way that the frontier was settled was by giving tax-free land to both Hindu and Muslim pioneers who would receive this land on the condition that they build either a temple or a mosque. So a Hindu pioneer would build a temple, a Muslim pioneer would build a mosque, uh, both of them would be uh, tax-free, and both of them would serve as kind of nucleuses or nuclei of new farming communities, which would be loyal to the state because every one of these uh, farmans or sonads that were issued had at the end of it the clause that the, the, the recipient of this land must assiduously pray for the long life of the state. Next slide, please. So there were, there were hundreds of these kinds of documents that I, that I found uh, in, in uh, Bengal, in East Bengal, in Bangladesh, such as this sanad here given by Muhammad Shah, uh, issued by, in the name of Muhammad Shah, but was actually issued locally. Uh, and the purpose of this sanad was to recognize the, uh, the construction of a mosque, uh, a rural mosque uh, that was uh, actually donated by a Hindu chowdhury, uh, and we have the opposite thing happening as well. Muslim chowderies uh, oftentimes uh, issued land for the destruction of devotars or tax-free lands supporting a goddess temple. And there are hundreds of these uh, across the, the Bengal frontier. Uh, the point being that the Mughal state was primarily interested in three things, stability, loyalty, and revenue. They did not care whether the pioneer had been a Muslim or a Hindu, 
Uh, they don't care whether the structure is a mosque or a temple. What they want is stability, loyalty, and revenue. Uh, and to give an example, uh, in the far northeastern part of Bengal, in Selet, between 1660 and 1760, Mughal governors gave 16,000 acres of jungle uh, to pioneers. And all these were given to Hindus, either for the building of Shiva uh, temples, Vishnu temples, or goddess temples. In the same period, they give twice, twice as much land to Muslim holy men in the form of Mad Madari Maash. But the largest recipients of land were uh, destitute Brahmins uh, who were given on average some 30 acres of land each uh, to develop. Uh, again, all of these are understood as points of, of uh, important um, institutions or men who are understood as pious, as the Brahmins were. Uh, all of it for the purpose of, of as I say, uh, achieving a, a stability and loyalty on, the, on this very turbulent eastern frontier of Bengal. Next slide, please. So a fourth category, a fourth way that political rulers uh, related to temples was through the reuse of elements of those, tuttle, those temples, either for structural purposes or for strategic purposes. Uh, next slide. For example, uh, at the very beginning of the advent of the Delhi Sultanate in the Qutub Minar Mosque, uh, we see uh, many columns that were uh, used or recycled, reused uh, in the construction of this mosque. Next slide. Uh, and the, the purpose of this could be one or both uh, reasons, either for, for obviously for structural reasons, uh, you need to, to have great height. Uh, temple columns were stacked end on end. So you actually see two columns stacked together, uh, one on the bottom, one on the top, which, which gives, us, gives us great height uh, that they wanted to achieve. But the other purpose, of course, is that these kinds of columns had the strategic purpose of in one way or another, associating the new dynasty with the previous dynasty. These columns were clearly stripped from temples that had existed in the area, uh, probably demolished or, 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 and then recycled. Uh, and this kind of reuse is typically found in the, that initial phase that I referred to at the beginning of this lecture, uh, as the Gurids were marching down uh, the, uh, the 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 Gangetic Plain from the Punjab uh, down uh, further south and east. Now this pattern of reusing uh, earlier columns uh, is by no means confined to the the Muslim rulers of the, of North India. Next slide. Uh, when we go to the south, we have the the uh, Chalukya dynasty the so-called Western Chalukyas or the Kalyana Chalukyas that ruled between the 10th and the late 12th centuries, uh, they spanned virtually the entire Deccan Plateau, Maharashtra, Andhra, and much of Karnataka. And their great enemies, of course, were the Cholas to the south. Uh, and there's a whole story about the, uh, the sacking of temples between the Cholas and the Chalukyas, but that's a different story. I want to talk about reuse and I want to make the point that uh, one of the outstanding features of the Chalukya dynasty were the extraordinary, extraordinary columns which they built uh, out of, out of uh, schist, uh, very, very hard uh, blue-gray rock that were mined in the southern part of the Chalukya domain. Next slide. So you see these highly polished columns which are masterpieces of sculpture, I have to say, um, in temples such as this temple at Bagali, uh, a Shiva temple built in the, at the height of the Chuluka period in the mid 11th century. Next slide. Uh, another example, uh, same temple, just to give you a, a sense of the, the extraordinary uh, craftsmanship that went into building these uh, columns. Uh, 
Next slide. And here you see amidst them uh, a shorter column uh, that I've outlined in the, the in yellow, uh, just to give you a sense of the, the basic column. And these columns are important to look at here because long after the Chaluka dynasty uh, is is over, is finished, and is no longer ruling, these columns were recycled by both Muslim and Hindu rulers. Why? Because they wanted to associate themselves with the prestige and the glory of the great Chalukya Empire. Next slide. So here's a typical uh, half column, if you will, because it's going from the, from the roof down to uh, a, 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 a seat. And these are the kinds of, 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 uh, of, of columns that were recycled so or reused. Next slide. So here we are in Vijayanagara. Uh, this is the great uh, temple of Virupaksha, which is the original state temple of Vijayanagara, so it's extremely important. And there's a long uh, road or street going from the entrance of this temple to a mandapa. Next slide. And in that mandapa, you have two stories. The upper story has very crude columns built of local basalt. Uh, now, these are classic Vijayanagara style columns, which are very simple, nothing complicated here, nothing spectacular. But then you look below on the first story, the bottom story, you see here reused Chaluka columns. Why did they put them there and not above? Because this is at eye level when you're walking down the street. These are the columns you're going to see. And this, the point being that the, uh, that the, the emperors of Vijayanagara wanted to associate themselves with the Chalukyas, and they did that by kind of showcasing these spectacular columns from the 11th and 12th century and placing them right uh, uh, at street level in this mandapa at Virapaksha. Next uh, slide. Same thing. Now, now this is a close-up of the same columns, and you can see, uh, if you go to the next slide, next, yeah, these columns are more or less exactly the same kind that we saw earlier at Bagali in the 12th century, 11th century. Uh, <clears throat> so, in other words, about 500 years after the Chalukya dynasty was uh, out of power, their columns are still being recycled by subsequent rulers, in this case, Vijayanagara. Next slide. The Muslims did the same thing. Uh, here is a mosque built in Adoni, which is south of the capital of Vijayanagara, uh, built around the 1530s. When we look at the outside, the facade is a typical uh, Bijapuri style of mosque. But then we look in the inside of this mosque. Next slide. In the inside of the mosque, we see that the rulers, the Sultan of Bijapur, has done exactly the same thing that the rulers of Vijayanagara had done, which is to showcase Chalukya columns. And so once again, these 11th century and 12th century columns have been placed not around the periphery of this mosque, but right in the center of the mosque, uh, giving it the pride of place, that these are the columns which we want to showcase, because this is the dynasty that we want to associate ourselves with. So the use of architecture here is, to me, fascinating because it shows how the ruling kings, the sultans of Bijapur, wish to identify themselves with the Chalukya period, and they're doing it by reusing these columns. Next slide. The same thing happens in the capital. Above, you're looking at the most important gateway to the citadel, where we find 24 reused Chalukya columns, all clustered together in the most important entranceway that visitors to the capital and citadel would, would, would see. So again, uh, visitors are going to come through this area. Uh, they're going to see these columns, uh, illustrating once again the connection between the, the sultans of Pichapur and the old Chalukya uh, 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 Maharajas.
Furthermore, one of the other uh, entrances or darwazas to the fort, to the capital of Bijapur, features an entire makaratorana, which is a a uh, a a, um, a lintel above a doorway, and this is taken directly from a Chulka period uh, Makarat Torah and simply recycled, reused, once again associating the dynasty with the Chalukyas. So that's a, a, another form in which uh, people identified with, with temples. Next slide. And then we have redefinition. Uh, now, redefinition means in, instead of recycling one element, of a temple, like a column. Here, the entire temple is redefined in some way or another. Next slide. This is a reconstruction of what we think the most important church in the world looked like for almost a thousand years. This is the great Hagia Sophia Cathedral in Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, built by the Emperor Justinian in 537, and uh, it was the the most important church in the Christian world for 900 years until the Turks conquered Istanbul in 1453. Next slide. And all they did is add four minarets and make a few minor alterations in the interior, and suddenly a church becomes a mosque. Um, and that's my point. Now, there are many cases of this throughout world history, uh, uh, including, obviously, India. So, uh, next next image, please. So, here we have, again, the, in the Deccan, in the town of Bodhan, uh, a Kakatiya, Kakatiya temple built probably in the 11th century, was transformed into a mosque in the year 1323, and it's known as the Deva Masjid. And what's interesting here is that no structural alterations were made to the original temple except two. One thing they did was they simply added a number of domes on the, on the uh, entranceway to the temple, which is what you see here uh, above the red line. Next slide. Yeah, that, that's another uh, uh, image of the entranceway to the temple with these small domes on top. And then next slide. If you look into the interior, uh, nothing's been altered except a mihrab has been installed in the western end. And of course, that indicates that the temple is now uh, being used for a different purpose. But my point is that this occurred in 1323. None of these changes are, are, are accord with Tughluq style of architecture. Uh, the domes that you saw would never appear on a, a, a Tughluq monument. Uh, Tughluq mosques had, were either flat roofed or they had one single large dome uh, right in front of the mihrab. But the idea of putting 12 domes uh, over the entranceway uh, is, is quite bizarre and has no precedent in Tughluq architectural history. What happened is, and we know this from contemporary evidence of the historian uh, Isami, is that the chieftain of Bodhan converted to Islam, and to demonstrate his conversion, he simply ordered that this temple be tr transformed into a mosque. And it was his idea to put those domes on top of the of this temple uh, and make this this kind of transformation. Uh, so we have this kind of way in which uh, a temple is is uh, is engaged with by a, by a, by a ruling authority. In this case, uh, a, uh, a a local chieftain. Uh, next slide. And then there's imitation. Now here is an interesting way in which uh, forms uh, appear where there's no alteration to the original monument at all, but rather we are simply imitating it. We're building another monument which looks like that monument. Uh, next slide. There are lots of examples of this anywhere in the world you'll find this, in fact. Uh, to give one 
example that any American will understand is the, the uh, Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. is almost an exact replica of the ancient Parthenon of Athens. Obviously, the Americans wanted to identify their system of justice with the Greek tradition of justice. And so what you do, you use architecture to make that point. The same thing, of course, happens in India. Uh, next slide, please. Where the first Turkish ruler of North India, Muhammad Guri, uh, is issuing coins. Well, the coins that he issues for circulation west of the Indus River, extending all the way through, across Afghanistan, uh, up into, uh, uh, into Turkmenistan, uh, these coins all conform to traditional local Islamic conceptions of coinage. Next slide. But the same ruler, Muhammad of Ghori, when he's issuing coins in North India, is imitating the style of coin that was already in circulation under the very dynasty that he had defeated, namely the Chohana dynasty. So here we see a comparison of a silver coin of Ajaya Raja uh, in, the, in the 12th century with the goddess Lakshmi. And then we see below it a gold coin of Muhammad of Gore, uh, again with the goddess Lakshmi on the left and his own title uh, in, in Devanagari. So what, what we seem to be seeing here is a process of imitation, uh, an, an effort to uh, not present themselves as presenting an abrupt rupture with the previous dynasty, but rather to, to imitate uh, the style of that dynasty uh, in this instance through the use of coinage, because everybody sees coins and everybody uses coins, uh, it's a very easy way to project uh, one's ideology to the subjects. Uh, and we see the same thing happening throughout India in, in architecture as well. Next slide. For example, in Kerala, uh, both temples and mosques are imitating or conforming to local conceptions of, of architecture. Uh, and I think this is very important to understand uh, that oftentimes regional conceptions of space, regional notions of, of uh, proper uh, architecture are what local rulers will patronize. And obviously the builders are not imported from thousands of miles away. Uh, the, the masons, the stone makers, uh, the woodworkers and so forth are all local. So in all likelihood, the same workmen who built a mosque would also build a temple and the architects would be drawing on the same uh, aesthetic, the same kind of uh, understanding of, of, of what, what monuments should look like. Uh, next image, please. In Bengal, the, precisely the same, same thing happens uh, when you compare, for example, this mosque in, uh, in uh, Vishnupur in West Bengal, late 17th century, with uh, a, a mosque in, in, uh, in Maiman Singh in Eastern Bengal. Uh, once again, we have the same features, uh, a curved cornice, uh, terracotta facade uh, with uh, three openings and uh, at the arched openings in the bottom uh, and uh, with, with dome-like structures on top. Uh, all of them clearly borrowing from a common vocabulary, a common architectural vocabulary. Uh, and conforming to and imitating uh, ultimately the same kind of vernacular architecture that had been uh, so deeply in, uh, embedded in, in, in Bengal. So next slide. So that whether we're looking at in Kerala or Bengal, uh, the point is we had these regional uh, variants where architecture ultimately uh, conforms to indigenous or local understandings of, of, of style. Um, okay, next. This is, now we're back in Vijayanagara, and I use this slide to illustrate another kind of, uh, of use of architecture. Uh, in this instance, the, the patrons, uh, with the ruling patrons, the rulers of Vijayanagara in the 15th century, wished to associate themselves with the, a broader trans-regional world. 
a, a, a world informed by Persian conceptions of space and architectural vocabulary. So here we have secular buildings, the so-called elephant stables, uh, as well as this, this arched uh, aisle with, uh, with, with uh, vaulting and arches that are taken directly from Persian understandings of architecture. And we can contrast this building with another building nearby. Next slide. Yeah, this one you see below is a mosque uh, patronized by a, uh, uh, a, a, a local commander, Amr Khan, who was fighting on behalf of Vijayanagara. And what's fascinating to me is that the, the style of this mosque is not in what you might call Persian uh, form, but rather it's in the local style used by uh, Vijayanagara emperors for their own temples. So there's a local style that is being used by a Muslim, and there is a foreign or Persian style that's being used by the rulers uh, in the same city. These two monuments are only about one kilometer in distance from each other, and yet they rather dramatically illustrate what I would regard as the fallacy of uh, talking about any such thing as Muslim architecture or Hindu architecture really has no meaning. Uh, if, you, if you call the above arches Muslim architecture, when, when it's obviously being used only to make government buildings by, by a Hindu patron, or you call the lower mosque uh, uh, Hindu architecture, when in fact it's a mosque, uh, you can see how those terms uh, really do not give us much insight into anything. Next slide. And then we go back to the, the Govinda Deva temple uh, patronized by Man Singh uh, under Akbar. Again, it's very difficult to call this either Hindu or architecture or Muslim architecture. I think all we can really call it is Mughal imperial architecture or, or Persian architecture. And then finally, uh, slide, next slide. Uh, I want to, the, the last way in which I want to discuss the way that, that rulers deal with temples is by appropriation, making it your own. Uh, next slide. Here we have uh, Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah II of Bijapur, contemporary with Akbar and Jahangir, very well known for his uh, fascination with Indian music and Indian religion. You see him identified with castanets and a, a musical uh, 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 a tar of some kind. Maybe it's, I'm not sure exactly what the name of that is, but anyway. Uh, next slide. Uh, Ibrahim patronized extraordinary works of Deccani art, such as the uh, goddess Saraswati uh, on the left, uh, or this yogini on the on the right. Uh, and his fascination with, with Indian culture, uh, music, religion, all of it, is further seen in the way in which he appropriates a, 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 a Chalukya period temple. Uh, next slide. Now here we are uh, again in the former capital of the great Chalukya dynasty, Kalyana, which is under the control of Ibrahim Adil Shah. And he builds this palace around 1600. We are now standing in the courtyard and we're looking straight ahead in that opening and we're going to walk through that where the arrow is. We're going to walk into that hallway. Next slide. And here you see uh, the interior of the palace. Uh, very typical Persian style. Nothing surprising about this. And then we're, we're going to go back outside. Next slide, please. And now we're going to go into the other opening to the left. From the courtyard, we go through this opening. And what we find is an intact Chalukya temple. Next slide. What, what Ibrahim II has done here is he has, he has taken a temple that was already there, hasn't been moved, and he's simply encasing it uh, as part of the palace of Kalyana. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, Ibrahim II did this because he is already known from literary sources uh, as worshiping uh, 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 the goddess Saraswati. Uh, 
You saw that image a moment ago uh, that he patronized in art. So I want to conclude this discussion this morning with a few general points. Next slide, please. But I know that historians have been focusing especially on the issue of temple destruction, temple desecration, as if that were the only way that Muslim rulers related to uh, the built environment that they encountered. And the argument that I would like to make is that historians really need to see uh, temple desecration as only one of several ways in which uh, rulers uh, reacted or related to the existing environment. The first one, non-intervention, is by far the most common. And it gets almost no attention because nothing happened. Desecration, uh, of course, is the second one I mentioned as being a, a, a way which gets almost all the, the attention. Thirdly, uh, patronage, uh, either patronizing a, a pre-existing temple or patronizing the construction of a new temple uh, is a third way that Muslim rulers related to, to uh, the whole issue of temples. Fourthly, uh, reuse, uh, whether it's simply reusing columns because they're handy, they happen to be nearby, uh, or, or you've, you've taken down a temple and you need to use something to hold up the roof, you simply use it for structural purposes, or you use it for strategic purposes. You want to identify yourself with that previous dynasty uh, in the same way that you include an image of Lakshmi, on uh, the goddess Lakshmi on the coinage, uh, which was happening at the same time that these earlier columns were being used in, in, in the uh, mosque under the Gorids. So you have reuse. And then fifthly, number five, you can redefine. Uh, some temples were actually left completely intact, but simply redefined as mosques. And number six, uh, you, you imitate. Uh, you build temples or mosques that conform to indigenous conceptions of form. Uh, and this is very commonly found throughout India, indeed throughout the world. And then finally, lastly, uh, the idea of appropriating, simply making a temple your own and including it in your, 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 own, uh, your own palace or whatever it might be. So to conclude all of this, my, my argument is, my plea is that historians, I think, need to appreciate that there is a wide range of possible outcomes when new rulers engage with the existing built environment they, that they encounter, and that desecration is, is only one of seven or eight forms. So with that, I will conclude and look forward to any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Richard Eaton. There are a large number of questions and comments. Uh, you would be bombarded with them. Uh, there are uh, also uh, certain issues which have been raised um, uh, that uh, this lecture is an attempt at distortion. Uh, uh, while you were lecturing, I just uh, tried to ask them, please give your arguments. We are here to uh, uh, give you uh, what Richard Eaton has done, uh, given you evidence of what happened. Uh, uh, you, if find anything which is different, uh, uh, the facts are different from what Eaton says, you please come up with your uh, uh, Manmohan Sharma says, deliberate fabricating new Indian history. So come up with certain facts. Uh, uh, we are going to listen to you, but please do come up with facts. Cite as evidence, we are going to listen to you. Historians uh, base their argument only on what their sources tell them. So come up uh, with sources. We are going to have a discussion with you. Uh, let us have Shagufta certain of the questions. Uh, Hasnain Aziz, uh, 
uh, has asked, sir, you have tried to solve the riddle that why Bangladesh uh, became Muslim majority. Will you also write a book on why Pakistan, that is not Western area of Indian subcontinent, became Muslim majority? What are your views on that? Well, uh, this has nothing to do with temples, obviously. Okay. But um, a huge question, uh, impossible to answer in a, in, a, in a sentence or two. But uh, I guess the reason that I wanted to study Bengal was because it was so far away from Central Asia, and the case for 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 conversion was much more clear. Whereas in Pakistan. Uh, you are right on the migration corridor from Central Asia and Afghanistan, and uh, a, a great many, a, a large proportion of the population uh, simply walked or marched from Central Asia and Afghanistan into the Indus Valley. Uh, so you do not have a clear case of, of, of conversion, or as clear as you do in Bengal. Bengal is so far away. Uh, that there's that it's simply not possible to argue that that people walked all the way from Samarkand uh, by droves and, and 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 suddenly reached you know Dhaka or something. Whereas in the case of the Indus Valley, uh, we know from historical evidence that there was repeated migration, uh, provoked especially by the the Mongols. It's very important to remember that Genghis Khan uh, in the early 13th century kicked off a series of, of invasions that lasted for over 150 years, uh, repeated Mongol invasions, constantly threatening North India. Uh, indeed, it was the Delhi Sultanate which rescued North India from the conquest by the Mongols. And for that, we should be grateful, uh, considering what the Mongols did in other parts of the world. But in the course of those, those invasions, Hundreds of thousands of, of uh, civilians were driven from their homes in Central Asia uh, and Afghanistan uh, down these migration corridors into northwestern part of the subcontinent. So clearly, uh, one important, very important uh, um, element to explain the large Muslim population in the Indus Valley area, all the way from Kashmir down to Sindh uh, is is migration and not conversion. So the the story in Pakistan is much less clear to me than is the story in Bengal. Uh, in Bengal, it's a really a case of an entire population in eastern Bengal uh, be, be, becoming a Muslim majority community, whereas in 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 Pakistan. It's a combination of different factors, only one of which is migration, and another of which uh, is, is, is conversion, especially among the Jat community uh, as they moved up into, into the Punjab. So anyway, it, it is a riddle, uh, and I wish somebody would, would, would move into answering your question uh, with the same sense of, of purpose that I tried to do in the case of Bengal. But anyway, I thank you for your question. It is a very important one. Uh, the next question, next one, please. Uh, uh, Rupa Abdi, uh, uh, sir, is it true uh, that the persecution of the followers of one religion by another existed in the Indian subcontinent even before the advent of Islam? Religious sects in ancient India were largely accommodative towards each other. However, there were incidents of attacks and the appropriation of Buddhist and Jain sacred places by Brahminical sects. Pushu Mitra, a Brahmin king and founder of Shunga dynasty, is reported to have persecuted Buddhists. Uh, Shashank, a Shaivite Brahmin uh, king, uh, I can't read uh, beyond that, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, thank you for that observation. Um, I, I can only agree that it is true uh, that there is lots of evidence of various kinds of uh, persecution, uh, uh, inter-religious or inter-sectarian persecution that took place in India long before the advent of Islam. Uh, I think any 
honest historians knows that. Uh, and then really, I think it needs to be, the question needs to be broken down a bit more. Uh, at one level, at the level of kings fighting other kings, you have what I refer to in my own lecture, which is the case of, for example, the, the Cholas uh, desecrating temples of the Chalukyas because the Chalukyas were their enemies. So those are kings against other kings, and those are largely political in nature. But then you have evidence of, uh, of giant temples uh, being transformed uh, in, into uh, Shaiva uh, temples with clear evidence of destruction having taken place, or Buddhist uh, uh, monuments of various kinds being uh, altered. Um, so, and that's different from royal. That's that that that's a sectarian issue, and I think these need to be distinguished. But in any event, the point does remain that. There was certainly plenty of uh, interreligious conflict that occurred in, in India's long history before the Turks did arrive. So thank you for that question as well. Uh, is it also true, Rupa Abdi asks, that during the Maratha Mysore conflict of 1700s, the British had recruited the Maratha army to take on Tipu Sultan? After the Maratha army ransacked the uh, Shringeri monastery in Mysore, Tipu Sultan offered his resources for the consecration of the goddess. Yes, I have heard that. Uh, I have not made a, a formal study of Tipu Sultan's reign, so I'm not in a position to confirm that. But I have heard the same uh, story, and I would I would be very curious to know uh, what kind of historical evidence we have to support that. So it's, it's very possibly true. And I, it's something that needs to be looked into. Uh, right, sir. Next one, please. Uh, Manmohan Sharma, I am also a student of Indian history, but during my study, I never came across a single incident when temple was burned down by any rival Hindu king. Your comments. Um, burning was... Well, a, a, a temple built of stone is difficult to burn. Uh, more typically, they were simply torn down with elephants. Um, but that, that's a minor point. The, the larger point is you're, 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 you're stating that there was no incidence of, of temple demolition. It is true that demolition was not typically done by kings against other enemy kings. The most typical form of desecration was to remove the icon the Murti, from that temple, take it out of there and bring it back to your own territory as a trophy. And by doing that, by taking the deity out of the temple, the temple is no longer a temple. It no longer serves the function of protecting the kingdom uh, of which the Maharaja is the ruler. So the short answer is that in... in uh, inter-Indian uh, conflicts before the Turks arrived, uh, it was not considered necessary to demolish the temple in most cases. Although there are cases of, of total demolition, uh, I can cite several uh, that, that we have contemporary evidence of where the, the rulers were actually gloating or taking delight in the fact that they demolished the temple. But it is not the most common way. The most common way is simply to, to remove the, the icon uh, from the precincts of the temple. Uh, right, so uh, uh, Manmohan Singh, once again, he asks, it, it is not the fact that Devgar temple complex built in 8 AD consists of Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist temples. Is this, don't contradict your theory. I don't know what he wants to say. Uh, I'm not sure what 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 the point of this is. It is true. That, possibly what he wants to say is that there are all type of deities within the temple. Uh, so uh, does it not contradict the fact that the Buddhist and Jain's uh, temples were replaced by uh, the others? That is what he's trying to ask. Right, right, right. I, I, I mean, 
right. There are there are plenty of businesses where a single monument might might be used by different communities. Um, I know that it is it is not unusual in Maharashtra to find uh, uh, Sufi shrines uh, that were used both by Hindu communities and by by Muslims, um, and 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 there was it's the same structure, the same you know in this case a darga, uh, but so this is not unusual. And it's, what you're what you're citing here about uh, monuments that were used by multiple communities that also did happen. Um, I, so I would not disagree with that. Uh, well, I would like to add something uh, to the first question, which was uh, the uh, question which was earlier asked, uh, which uh, uh, Professor Eaton did reply back. But I would like to add. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there uh, were certain excavations which took place uh, uh, around 20 years back at Atipur Sikri uh, at a uh, site known as Bir Chabili Ka Tila, uh, which is just uh, near the lake of Atipur Sikri outside the palace complex. Right. Uh, the, the excavations were done by the uh, archaeologists of the ASI, D.V. Sharma was one of the in charges of that, he was leading these excavations. And what he found was that, uh, you know, uh, on a mound, which was known as Bir Chamili uh, Katila, on which there were certain uh, Mughal period graves, uh -huh. when he dug it, they found a temple structure below that. And uh, the news was given that uh, possibly uh, the temple had been destroyed uh, by the Muslim conquerors and replaced uh, by something else. But uh, soon enough, ASI itself, uh, you know, excavated, D.V. Sharma excavated, and it was also reported not only in their, uh, you know, ASI reports, brief reports, but also in the newspapers that very near to the door of the temple, uh. they found the pit. And within the pit, there were broken Jain sculptural, uh, you know, pieces which had been buried, and the temple, which was originally Jain, had been converted into a Vaishnava temple sometime during the 11th century. So, uh, 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 Sharma ji, these incidents have been happening. Sure. The only thing is that we do not want to see them. We try to ignore them. Right. It is done by the ASI itself. It is in their reports. You can go and check it. Uh, uh, Ali Hader has another question. So, so does, I, I, I have a question about that. It, where right. was the site that you was that you said Fatehpur Sikri? At Fatehpur Sikri, At very Fatipur. near to the yeah. yeah. So, in fact, the newspapers of that period. I remember that I had been sent by Indian History Congress to investigate it ultimately. The newspapers, especially the Hindi newspapers, started claiming as if Akbar was responsible for the demolition of the temple. I see. But later on, when the full report came, it appeared that the Mughals had nothing to do. This destruction had taken place during the 11th century. And the Jain uh, sculptures, which were found buried, had been broken. And except for one, the main deity, all the other, uh, you know, pieces of these sculptures, they were buried upside down. Right. Oh, really? And yeah. on the top of the uh, temple, the new uh, new temple which had arisen below the graves, uh, it had been converted into a Vaishnava structure. The Garbagare ultimately had idols which were Vaishnava. This is very interesting. And I, I'm sure it's especially interesting to you, given your own work on Fatipur Sikri. And, and I mean, you, you are the one who's done the study of this area. So that's, that's extraordinary. I know that's a very interesting story. Yeah. Uh, right, sir. Thank uh, you. So uh, Ali Haider asks, sir, does according to Hanafi fiqh, Hindus also regarded as, were also regarded as people of the book by Muslim rulers by giving them the status of Zimmis? And did Shungas destroy Buddhist temples and monasteries like Nalanda? Well, it is certainly true that um, the the rulers 
Muslim rulers generally did adhere to a de facto policy of treating Hindus as though they were Thimmi. Um, I think that was a, a policy that, that arose out of, out of necessity and practicality, uh, which is to say it is simply not feasible to expect an entire population to convert to Islam, even though many uh, Muslim uh, you know, clerics might have wished that to happen. Uh, rulers knew better. So the, the, the de facto practical treatment was as of, as of, as you, as you say, this, this Hanafi uh, uh, people of book. Um, I don't know of any particular jurist who made that ruling. I would be interested to know uh, more about that if there was a, a, a ruling that was made by a mufti or, or any, in any, uh, you know, body of Qazis who might have done that. But certainly the, the effect of Vimy was exactly what was done. And there is precedent for that. When you, when you think about it, going all the way back to the 8th century, when Muhammad bin Qasim conquered Sindh, he did specifically uh, treat the Hindus and the Buddhists of Sindh as Vimy population, and he used that word. So you can argue that this has a very deep and very old history in South Asia. Um, as for the temples at Nalanda, um, Nalanda, I'm trying to remember. No, I don't think the temples at Nalanda were actually, the minister, monasteries were destroyed by the Turks. Uh, they were, however, at other uh, monasteries uh, in, in Bihar uh, in the course of the initial conquest of Bihar in the early 13th century. Um, and uh, the, the, we know that because we have a contemporary record. Um, the uh, the, the Tawakat al-Nasari tells us very clearly that when the Muslims reached, um, when Bakhtiar Khilji reached the area of Bihar, uh, he mistook the monasteries for fortresses. And they were surprised after they destroyed the place to find a library of Buddhist sutras, texts, and did not know that what they had actually destroyed was a monastery. Um, so that is also part of the story, I think, that needs to be remembered. I mean, these are some of the popular myths uh, which have been, uh, you know, uh, oh, know. Uh, built up. I mean, we have evidence and, uh, I mean, I am forgetting the name of uh, some of these scholars uh, who have actually uh, worked on this particular theme have, and have, they have tried to demonstrate right. that uh, Nalanda was initially broken much before the establishment of the Turkish rule in India. And uh, I think uh, if you Google search, you will find those articles uh, uh, without evidence, no need to uh, talk about anything. Right. Right. As far as uh, the question which uh, was asked about uh, the Zimmis, uh, uh, probably Eaton Saab has answered that, but I would add a little to that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Zia Barni, uh, who was a very strict theologian and one of the very famous historians of the Sultanate period who wrote uh, Tariq e Firo Shahi. Right. Uh, he uh, also wrote a book on fatawas. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, he makes a statement. And the statement is that a country like India can never be ruled only by Sharia. And what we need is the country be ruled by Zawabit, the secular law. So, in fact, from uh, the uh, period of the Ilbari Turks, or at least from the Khalji period onwards, uh, this policy of taking everyone together had been in practice. Right. Uh, my only plea is, please read the history books, not the mythologies which are being circulated at uh, uh, the uh, moment of time. Yes. I would also like to point out that by Aurangzeb's period, uh, a situation had arisen that in Gujarat, and I am very being very specific that uh, 
there are certain you know legal documents from gujarat kambe surat ahmedabad which talk about shariat as being just law not islamic law i had also uh, i cited this uh, in one of the other uh, previous lectures also but i am going to cite it once again that a case was brought about by a hindu woman who had converted to islam wanted she wanted share in her dead father's property the qazi uh, said that i would find out what is th uh, the position in the sharia right and uh, the uh, people of sharia the pandits were called and then the decision was given that this musammat this lady who had converted to islam cannot inherit the property of her dead father because she has converted so there is enough evidence that uh, uh, i mean uh, the the uh, zimmis uh, the hindus were treated as zimmis and there were certain uh, rules and regulations through which they were being uh, you know ruled uh, and, you know, there's also a, an interesting book that a, a very important book that just was published this year uh, that takes up the very question you raise about law and the meaning of sharia I, i'm referring to a book by nandini chatterjee yes called negotiating law in mogul india something like that right right, she right. studies a series of persian documents from malwa uh, clearly showing that the word sharia simply meant uh legal or valid um right and that what was really happening was that that they what the what the what they were doing was following local custom which they called dastur right and and then but the word sharia only took on the very specific meaning of islamic law exclusively islamic law uh with the coming of the british in in the late 18th century so that's that's a very important point that i'm glad you raised uh well there is a comment uh, by manmohan sharma uh, that the secular lobby of amu deliberately planted professor eaton to whitewash all the sins of medieval muslim rulers manmohan sahab mai to aap se itni der se farma raha hu aap kuch evidence leke aa jaiye na aapko to mai jis tarah se lecture chal raha hai tab se keh raha hu ek evidence provide kar dijiye let us uh, discuss it hmm मोदी जी की तरह सिर्फ स्टेटमेंट देने से काम नहीं चलेगा कम आउट विद योर आर्गुमेंट नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन प्लीज एनी अदर क्वेश्चन विद मुस्लिम डेनेस्टीज सेव फॉर अहमद शाह अब्दाली एंड नादिर शाह एंड तैमूर आई कैनॉट बी कॉल्ड it cannot be called plunder and loot but rather merely wealth changing hands because the muslim rulers both the turks afghans and moguls made india home that is a comment not a question are there any questions uh, ashufta any question uh, anil joshi ji has a question the chalukyan temple you mentioned in one of the slides is in kalyan or kalyani ah It's Kalyan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a. Thank you for raising that. No, this is this is not Kalyan near Mumbai. No, no, not Mumbai. This is the Deccan Kalyan in the. It's very close to Bidar, in the central Deccan plateau, in uh, northeastern Karnataka, the extreme northeastern Karnataka near Bidar, and it's a. It's the ancient capital of of the Chalukyas. right uh, uh manimuk sharma um excellent lecture thank you professor eaton one question how can generalists who may or may not be historically well informed effectively <laughs> counter the vicious propaganda about temple desecrations uh in medieval and early modern india that is used to justify modern crimes against minorities That's a very good question, and <clears throat> thank you for raising it. Um, I, I think that I think that all we could really do as historians 
is to insist that we go look at the evidence. And the evidence, as I said at the outset uh, of the lecture, <clears throat> is always blurred. It's never, it's never completely clear because it's never complete. It's, it's always, it's always <clears throat> partial. So we have to look at what we do have and make judgments to fill up the gaps. But it is a, indeed a, a real problem that so much of current politics in South Asia is driven by uh, mythology or or, <clears throat> or or people who really don't know much about the history, uh, and and this has kind of become into to to infect the, the public discourse. Uh, <clears throat> I can only say that historians, it seems to me, have a real responsibility to to publicize their findings and to inform the public as best they can. Uh, of, of what we have been able to understand based on contemporary evidence. Uh, this is the reason that I decided to go back and look at the original Persian inscriptions when all this furor over temple destruction arose after the Babri Masjid incident of 1993. And it seems to me that this is what all uh, historians should be doing, and I hope that more will be doing exactly the same kind of work. Right. Uh, uh, can we have uh, some uh, other question? Uh, uh, let us have a question, please. Nanak Ganguly uh, asks, but there was a difference, as you have pointed out in your essay, Temple Destruction and Indo-Muslim State, where Abul Fazal attributed Mahmud's excesses to fanatical bigots who have incorrectly represented India as a country of unbelievers at war with Islam that incited the Sultan's unsuspecting nature, which led to the wreck of honor and the shedding of blood and the plunder of uh, the virtuous. Whereas Peter Jackson uh, believes Mahmood's action was sui generis. However, from Akbar's reign, uh, I can't read beyond that. Uh, so it was a comment, uh, possibly yeah. not a question. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I think that only shows that even in the age of Akbar, when you have Abul Fasl himself uh, complaining how the 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 memory of Mahmud of Ghazni had already been distorted. I find that interesting and very important because it, it suggests that the distortion of history did not begin with the 20th century or with the coming of the British. But history has been distorted already in the in the period of Akbar. And Abul Fasl himself is complaining about precisely that kind of distortion, that, it was, he, that Mahmoud uh, has, has given all Muslims a very bad name, uh, it, 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 it is what he's saying in that. So that's a very important point. Uh, Dig Vijay Singh uh, has a question. Uh, 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 he says that uh, my question to uh, 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 Mr. Richard Eaton is unrelated to the discussion, but with regard to his brilliant book, India in the Persianate Age. Why does he believe that most vernacular Indian languages date from the previous millennium and not prior to that? I request him to share the reasons uh, uh, which he came uh, of, uh, uh, to the conclusion. Well, when we talk about vernacular Indian languages, we need to distinguish between the appearance of the spoken language and the appearance of the written language. In every language of the world, written languages only appear long after the spoken language has already become common. And of course, many languages never become written. They remain spoken and they disappear. So I think what the historian is trying to do is to document at what point do written vernaculars appear? And why do they appear at the particular time they do? Uh, and we also need to distinguish between what the purposes were for writing the language. Uh, for example, writing documents, recording how much revenue is owed by uh, a particular farmer to the state, these kinds of things get recorded much earlier than do 
abstract reflections on philosophy or on religion or discourses on on uh, on, on political theory. Uh, in other words, in in Sanskrit, for example, uh, you have long before you have uh, 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 you know abstract discourses, you have everyday use of, of recording facts. And the same thing with vernacular languages. Vernacular languages appear in different times in different parts of India. There's, it's impossible to make one generalization. Uh, but one, but Shelley Pollock, for Sheldon Pollock, has referred to the vernacular millennium as beginning approximately 1000 AD. Um, that's only when the writ written forms of those languages began to appear. Clearly, vernacular languages had been around all the time, uh, long before they began to appear in, 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 uh, in, in written form. So that's what's interesting for the historian, is to understand why and when the written forms begin to appear and in what context. Uh, well, there is a very good question, sir. Mm, uh, my name is Deep Saran Bhatnagar. I largely agree with broad conclusion, but what explains almost uh, uh, what explains that almost no big Indic architecture survive without any kind of damage or change, especially in North India. Well, I think it's it's logical to assume that the the biggest monuments the biggest temples would have been those very temples that were patronized by the great Maharajas. And those were the temples that were demolished. So in the initial conquest of the Gangetic Plain, we see that moving military frontier. Uh, and it was it was those large temples that were, that were destroyed. And clearly there's no remnants of them left. Um, but as I remarked earlier, temples that were that had been in an earlier time had been important centers of, of political power, uh, capitals of major dynasties. But when those dynasties were no longer in power, then the temples tended to survive. Kajaraho, I think, is a perfect example of exactly that point. So, again, it all points to the politics of North India uh, and the particular political context that. Uh, uh, that, that we find when there are these encounters. Uh, right, uh, so there was a uh, question by uh, someone uh, regarding, uh, sir, which authors and books will you suggest to read to know about Muslim patronage of Hindu temples and to know about temple desecration by non-Muslim rulers? Uh, <laughs> good question. I, I, I do not know of any single book, uh, sadly, that, that addresses all of those issues. Now, there have been a number of articles and journal articles, very specialized articles that, that take up these matters. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I would say there has not been a single uh, volume that has attempted to draw all this together. Um, and I talk about patronage of, of Hindu temples. I can give you one, one example. Catherine Asher, for example, has written a number of very important articles on what she calls sub-imperial patronage. Uh, I referred in my lecture to Man Singh on the, in the period of Akbar, who patronized the construction of the, of the, the Govinda Deva temple in Vrindavan. Uh, and she has a long essay on that, uh, together with other temples that were that were patronized by Man Singh uh, in North India. Uh, so one author is is is, is uh, Professor Asher, Catherine Asher, who's also written a a survey under the I think it's the the New Cambridge History of India uh, on architecture under the Mughals, in which she has a long section again on the subject of of uh, uh, Muslim patronage of, of Hindu temples in North India. So that's one art historian, but I wish there were more that were doing the same topic. Uh, well, uh, Mirza Hasan has a second part to his question, and that is, 
how do you see works of sita ram goel and henry mir zilliet oh sita ram goel his effort to uh blame muslims for thousands of temple destruction is actually what initially got me interested in looking at the original evidence because when i read his book i realized that he was not really looking at original evidence uh it, going back to the original persian inscriptions and i felt that somebody needed to do that uh so that is what i did i i i not i launched my own inquiry precisely motivated by his work so that's a good example of how uh let's say one kind of scholarship can provoke or trigger a, a different kind of scholarship uh, so i like so I must thank uh, Sita Ram Goel for actually starting me down this path. <laughs> and, and also P.N. Oak. P.N. Oak years ago uh, wrote me a personal letter uh, thanking me for my book, Sufis of Bijapur, in which I argued about Sufis as warriors. Uh, and of course, P.N. Oak is the famous, uh, we all remember him as, as writing the books such as the, the Taj Mahal as a Rajput palace or something like this. So. In a sense, you know, these all these people did get me to think more seriously about these topics, and I, I, I have, I have Sita Ram Goel and P. N. Oak to thank for starting my own work on this issue. <laughs> uh, uh, well, there is a question by Wahid Bhatt, sir. Any evidence of temple destruction in Kashmir? Oh yes, of course. Uh, we know that. Uh, I guess it was the 14th century or 15th century uh, when we find uh, uh, Sultan, uh, I think it's Sikandar, Bot Shikan, in fact, was his very name, uh, the, 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 the breaker of temples. And um, yeah, so, and, and he was the father of, of course, one of the most well known sultans of Kashmiri history, uh, who. Um, uh, uh, Abed Zabel Abedin, who revoked that or turned against that very policy of temple destruction. But yes, of course, Kashmir has a, its own history of, of temple destruction that, that needs to be studied. Uh, and uh, there, there's no doubt that that did happen, of course. Uh, right. So, uh, Abu, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, you have mentioned about imitation of 14th century mosque of Calicut with 17th century temple in Kasargod. Is there any political reasons for this imitation? Unfortunately, we do not know. Well, well, the, 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 let's say that the mosque in Calicut has been rebuilt several times. And so it's impossible to go back and reconstruct the original patronage. We do not know uh, how, how that might have worked out. At least I do not know, I should say. Um, but in in every instance, it's necessary, it's important, if possible, to find out who the original patrons were. We do know, however, that the, uh, the mosque was reconstructed over time uh, by successive patrons uh, in the period of the Zemran. Um, and, uh, and some of that work has been studied by uh, a, a young scholar, Sebastian Prang, who has a new book written called Monsoon Islam, which is a study of uh, not just Calicut in the period of, uh, of the, the Zamorans, but also the, that particular mosque. Uh, is. So you'll find more information about that mosque in his book uh, called Monsoon Islam. Uh, any... Uh, about Fatawai Alamgiri, didn't it actually follow uh, by the uh, time of Aurangzeb? Uh, so, uh, what is the question? Uh, any view? Fatawai about... Alamgiri. Yes. Well, I, I mean, this was the you're referring to the huge compilation of of uh, of of, uh, of Islamic law <clears throat> under the direction of Alamgir. And uh, yes, it was 
it was one of the largest and one of the most important efforts made to consolidate uh, the, the the Sharia Islamic law uh, ever done in India, and and it has been used consistently ever since then. So yes, there there is that to be said. Who do we have here? Joseph Stalin? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Lockheed Martin has a comment, a beautiful comment to make. Uh, first, he accuses you that, uh, why did you talk about Aurangzeb's Farman of 1669? But in another comment, he says, uh, uh, India is secular as long as Hindus are in majority. The day Muslim will come, they will demand Sharia as happened in Pakistan and Bangladesh. That is his opinion, uh, and he's entitled to it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Eaton, I think, uh, uh, although there are uh, many, many questions uh, which are there, uh, but we have uh, actually uh, completed almost two hours, one, one hour, 45 minutes. Uh, there is always an end to everything. Um, uh, I must thank you. Uh, yes, there are many who would not agree with uh, 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 what the evidence talks about. Um, uh, history, unfortunately, uh, is a subject uh, which bases itself only on the evidence which has been handed down to us from the past. It may be bad, it may be good. It may be to our liking, it may not be to our liking. But the past is our past. No one can deny that temples were not destroyed. As no one can deny that in modern democratic India, which is a republic, there was a destruction of a place of worship. The destruction of a mosque, no one can deny. Only two days back, a temple dedicated to a saint who was worshipped in common by both Hindus and Muslims, the idol was removed. And what was said was that he cannot be, uh, you know, uh, his idol cannot be kept in the temple because he was a Muslim. So these things, when they are happening in modern 21st century India, we are dealing with a time which is supposed to be pre-modern. In spite of the fact that, yes, there were destructions which took place. A large number of temples were destructed. Even the work of Professor Richard Eaton, as he himself started when he started his lecture, he pointed out that he could count around 80 temples which had been destroyed. 80 is a big number. Even if one place of worship has been destroyed, even if one place has been destroyed on the basis of religion, that brings shame to entire humanity. I don't think that Professor Richard Eaton is here to support or claim that Aurangzeb was a very great ruler. He was a great ruler because of the fact that he presided over a great empire, but he was also a man who was responsible ultimately for the decline of the Mughal Empire. No one can deny those facts. The only thing which we are trying to argue is that see everything in its proper perspective. Yes, there were Muslims who took pride in claiming, even if they had not done so, uh, 
that they had destroyed temples and i'll give you an example the example come comes from the fort of kalinjar which is in banda district as all of you know that kalinjar fort within its boundaries contains a large number of gupta temples there are at least 14 or 15 temples which some of which date back to the gupta period which are there within the fort of kalinjar kalinjar is the fort which had been conquered by sher shah it was captured by sher shah but ultimately during the conquest of kalinjar fort a cannon ball had struck sher shah and it was due to that wound that he died at kalinjar he was temporarily buried there before being transported to bihar at sasara but soon after his death the his successor took up the throne islam shah became the ruler the ceremony of the uh, you know uh, crowning of islam shah took place in one of these structures which had already been built by the hindu rulers within the fort of kalinjar it was hurriedly named as the mosque with just one addition and that is the mihrab nothing else was changed in fact we don't even know whether it was a temple or it was an ordinary structure because within the main structure it is only a colonnaded pillared structure without any icons or images so it's probably not a temple but surely a building which had been built by the non muslim rulers from whom the kalinjar fort had been conquered this place was declared as the masjid and it was here that the coronation sermon for islam shah was given and to commemorate that on one of the pillars of this structure an inscription was hurriedly written it is not in nastaliq it is not you know in a very good script it is very hurriedly written but if you read that inscription uh, uh, professor eaton the claim is that the darul harb has been converted into darul islam without directly saying so what the verses of this inscription tell us is that most of the structures possibly temples have been broken and now freed from the pagans but i uh, would like every one of you to visit the fort of kalinjar to see that there is not even a single chisel mark on any of the temples at kalinjar in fact abul fazal later on during the period of akbar praises the very large uh, sculpture of kal bhairav which is there in one of the gupta temples within the kalinjar fort it is an image of kal bhairav with full nudity but not a chisel mark on its body what i am trying to say is that yes there have been rulers who have boasted just like the present rulers who boast of certain things without actually i mean uh, working on that there are examples of both the kind today professor eaton elucidated before us examples of the other kind never ever throughout his lecture did he say that the temple destruction did not take place what he said was that along with the destruction there were other facts also which we have to take into consideration he also pointed out that most of these destructions were in areas where there was some political war going on it was only 
in cases where there was a strife and a conflict of interest otherwise those temples or places of worship were never touched he also pointed out that those temples were never touched which did not represent the political authority which had been subjugated it was only those monuments which signified the authority of the erstwhile rulers they were the ones which were uh, uh, demolished and that had been happening even prior to the coming of the muslims in the country it was a practice of the medieval times which was being practiced almost throughout the world i would once again thank professor eaton for the patience which he has shown and to the audience uh, who remained with us listening to the beautiful lecture which Doc, uh, professor eaton gave today thank you very much and a I very good to all of you it's been a pleasure thank you very much